Hello, friends, and welcome to Adventures in Pixie Land. Uh, this uh, is going to be Bible study. We are in the Niv. We are in Second uh, Timothy's. We are doing uh, chapter two, verses one through twenty-one, which is not the whole chapter, uh, but it's broken into these various segments. Now, the beginning part of chapter two. Now, remember, this is uh, written in about sixty-six A.D. Uh, Timothy is the apprentice of Paul. This is a pastoral letter, so a personal letter from one pastor to another because Timothy has become the uh, head pastor at the church in Ephesus. You know, the Ephesian church. So, this is the closest thing to a son that Paul will ever have. So, it, you know, he's talking to him. And it's like father, son to somebody who went into the same profession as dad. Because really that's basically what Timothy has, has signed himself up for. His grandmother and his mother were earlier uh, converts to the faith. And so he has lived his life basically with Paul there with him since he was a very young man. So this has been his example. Because they don't, they don't talk about a father so I feel like this is this was his masculine role model. It's important to have a good, both feminine and masculine role models in the lives of any uh, young person. I've been very blessed to have um, not only my parents until uh, my mom uh, passed in August, but uh, other adults, their friends, older people that I've managed to encounter in just my travels with work and all kinds of different other things. And I have to tell you that that kind of wisdom givers, it's important to have a wide variety of wisdom givers. In fact, to me, it's very important to have a network. And it's important to have different people in your network who have different skill sets. Different skill sets means that you have different people you can ask for help to with different things. Um, I personally, like one of my skill sets is I kind of have a connector skill set. I tend to uh, gather people uh, sort of around me. I liken it to the Kennedy effect because um, you only have to go back to like my third or fourth great grandma or whatever on, on, uh, on dad's side to find the first Kennedy. And that there's actually it, within an, one more generation then you find other Kennedys. So, Kennedy blood, you know, from other parts of my family tree is what I'm saying. I've got three different lines of Kennedy in me. So pretty. That guy that was running for president that dropped out, seventh cousin, once removed. Uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrusted to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So do what, do what I did, teach what I taught you, and then trust people around you and teach them so they can teach others. Endure hardships with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. His commanding officer is up there. Uh, I mean, and that's pretty much like a thing. I remember from a very, uh, quite a young age, very young, I mean, this would be why at six, they put me in this thing. Uh, I grew up in the, in the Midwest until I was nine in Illinois, in suburbs of Chicago. So uh, my my one grandpa was a Shriner. The other one was a Master Mason and involved in the Eastern Star. On this side, it was a Shriner. And then uh, my dad was in the Lions Club. So when I was uh, six, they put me in this uh, thing called Awanas. And there I was what was called a spark. So it's an evangelical preacher training at kindergarten. Kindergarten, 
uh, through uh, eight, because I was in that until we moved to New Jersey at, at nine, or actually until the death of my aunt, which happened right before our move to New Jersey when I was nine. So, um, I've known from that quite that time, and this is, I think, is part of why I got sucked into that. It was like when somebody would want to be telling me what to do. I had a list of grown-ups that I had to listen to, so that I didn't have to listen to any grown-ups that went on that list. Especially if they wanted me to go with them anywhere. That's why you know why the list now existed. And uh, then also that I had a very clear thing. No, I don't have to do that. You're not the boss of me. I don't have to listen to you. You're not the boss of me. Who is the boss of you? Jesus. I have to listen to Jesus. And then I have to listen to, and then I could list you the grown-ups. But by default, the first answer was no, Jesus. So that's what he's saying. That's the commanding officer. The head of every church is Jesus, not a living person. Okay. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. So if you're going to be a leader in the church, that means you are the example. In fact, that's what it means to be a leader in anything. You are the example. What you do, you teach other people they're allowed to do. Your sins get passed down if you're not careful to not do those things. If you don't have uh, self-control, if you don't have will, if you don't have uh, faith, if you're not willing to be teachable to, to correct yourself, to remember that you, you're not the one in charge. No matter how much power you get on this earth, you're still not the one in charge. So you still got to bend the knee. Damn, the hard working farmer should be the first to receive his share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. You get, you know, where you put your work and where you concentrate your work is where a creator will first reward you for the work you put in. You have to be able to take care of you and then you can take care of others. So you have to keep, if you're a minister, think about what that means. If you're a minister, because a farmer can't just sell all his crops and not leave anything to feed himself and his family, because then he won't have the energy to plant more crops. So as a minister, he's saying, you've got to keep yourself spiritually clean. You've got to keep yourself in a state of purification. You can't pretend at this so that you can be the example to show other people how to do that. Remember, Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. For saying Jesus is the Messiah, because he was raised from, he is a descendant of David, as promised. Who was a rabbi, a prophet, he died, he rose again, he's the Messiah. So... And chained like a criminal. And he'll die for it. Because he's, this is under Nero now. Therefore I endure everything. For the sake of the elect. That they too may, uh, may obtain the salvation. That is in Christ Jesus. With eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him. We also live with him. If we endure. We will also reign with him. If we disown him. He will disown us. Baby. Was... Sorry, one of my reminders to check some on my, on my plant babies. Okay, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown us. So any point that we're walking away from him, we can correct ourselves, ask for forgiveness, and by correct ourselves means we have to stop doing what we were doing. He doesn't, there is no loophole where you get to keep doing that and just keep coming back and say, sorry. And he'll forgive you every single time you say sorry. But if you keep doing that, you're still not going to elevate. It just means you'll stay in that state of stasis where he looks at you going, are you sorry or aren't you sorry? I'm sorry implies change behavior. You can't do something like what you did that you apologize for that hurt that person's feelings and think it's not going to hurt their feelings again. 
but you're not supposed to become calloused to your behavior. You're supposed to stop your behavior. That's what sorry means. Okay. I, I, I say that like that because I've, I have, in the course of the past oral career, had to literally use those kinds of words for people because someone forgot to tell them that or someone forgot to show them that. You know, made my heart hurt for them. Adventures in Pixie Land. That was actually a, a gift many years ago from a very lovely lady named Selena that I had the pleasure to work with. Uh, this parable is called A Workman Approved by God. Verse 14. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. Which we do a whole lot of, don't we? The words of other people, too. Like two different people arguing about the words of someone else. And that's what we call political discourse these days. Nobody's really listening. <laughs> it is of no value and only ruins those who listen. They're not really, if they're name calling, they're not discussing policy, so they're not telling you anything you need to know other than they're giant children. Name calling is, what are you, in kindergarten? What's the matter with you? In fact, in kindergarten, I would have told you to be nice. Uh, do the, your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter. Because those who indulge in it will be, become more and more ungodly. There is nothing godly in aggression. There is nothing godly in malice. There is nothing godly in let me put you in your place. There is nothing. There is no love in it. There is no respect in it. There is no love in it. If you're name calling, you're not respected. That's there. No. It's okay to speak your truth. But if you feel the need to attack the character and not the point, not the message, not the truthfulness of the statement, not the whatever that is, and you're not doing it from a place of, you know, I disagree respectfully, you're already off course. Everybody's a human. There's not okay to try to dehumanize that's what all that is dehumanization that's totally satan there ain't no love in that if there's no love there's no god avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly their teaching will spread like gangrene among them are hymenus and philetus like that's crazy P-H-I-L-E-T-U-S. Don't come for me. <laughs> Who have wandered away from the truth. They say the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy faith of some. Nevertheless, stop laughing. I'm not laughing. You're laughing. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm. <laughs> Sealed. With this inscription, the Lord knows who those who are his, uh, A, uh, from Numbers uh, 615, so that's part of the prophecy, from the Septina, when we're saying in, in fulfillment with the prophecies, and everyone who confesses in the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. You have to try. It's, it's okay if you fail, but you have to try. If you're not even trying and you're just lip service saying you're sorry, then it doesn't count. It doesn't count because you, you're not really trying. He says, lips, he says this over and over again that you actually have to be sorry. There is no way forward but without faith in him. That's really what it means. 
do you trust or don't you? I mean, he doesn't do half measures, so he's not going to want half measures. Verse 20, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes and some for ignoble purposes. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to master, or to the master, the master, and prepared to do any good work. Now, if you've corrupted your soul with a lot of anger and aggression and hatred and violence and outbursts, I mean, you're going to see this in a lot of ways. There'll be a lot of drama. There'll be a lot. Of, if you're in that, there's no way out without purification. You got to work on wherever that trauma is that's being triggered. Because if you're popping off at the mouth in a way where you're name calling, you're also wrong. I'm sorry. If you did it where you stood your ground and you never once called that person a name and you kept it on the point, but things got loud. Okay, well then you're all right. I would recommend less loud though. Work on the need to not scream, but work on the ability to walk away when they start screaming at you. It doesn't make you weak. It makes you recognize that there this isn't gonna solve anything and then you need to go lower your blood pressure. Remember, when they do that, you guys are screaming at each other, your stress levels go up and they are actively making you fat. I encourage you to walk away from the fat, fat building fighting. Fighting equals fat. Do it with your brain. Not with your volume. I find if you get real direct and real factual, so you're not leaving any wiggle room to for your your their understanding, but you're also not name calling. They stop. They get quiet. Sometimes they even go and cry. Depends on how direct you want to be and, you know, how to the heart you want to get to. I'm not saying you should make other people cry. I'm just saying you don't need to raise your voice to make that happen. Okay? So, stop and think. They're not worth the health repercussions to the body that happens in the screaming match in the first place. And it's not good for your soul. You gotta find a way to heal what's being triggered to help you stay in alignment with him. You do that, and you're gonna start feeling that love vibration everywhere, and you're gonna find that you stop having these people who want to have the screaming matches around you. Because when they can't get the reaction that they need from you, because it's not a trauma, they're either gonna go heal it, or they're going to go find somebody else. And either way, they're going to stop bothering you. That's been my secret so far. And I am skinnier than I was at 24. At 46. So, until tomorrow, friends. Lower those stress levels. It's so worth it.